kids refused to go back to that spot. She was 15 when it happened. My son was seven. She had a friend visiting us from Coonabarabran who lived in the area and we were taking her back. So it was school holidays and she'd come and spend a week with us and we were taking her back. So it was a Sunday. We were left mid-morning. So we would have got to the waterfall not particularly long after lunch. So it's a good couple of hours drive from here. So it's a place I'm very familiar with. It's just off the road between Coonabarabran and Gilgandra. It's about 30 k's out of Coonabarabran, yep. Hickey's Falls, wasn't it, you mentioned? Hickey's Falls, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a well-known spot. Like lots of tourists would often stop there. They've redone the highway. So initially the highway, uh, you used to be able to turn straight off the highway into the car park, but they did a big upgrade. Uh, maybe 10 years or so ago, and you now actually have to drive onto the old highway and then you drive down uh, down the hill, maybe about a kilometre, and then you turn into so maybe 500, 800 metres down the old highway and then you turn into the car park from there. So it's very off the road now. It's not as visible as what it used to be mm-hmm. when we were kids. We pulled up and as you come down down the hill because it's situated right between two hills in a gully. It's quite isolated. Like you just, you see a very small glimpse of the highway. It's just a natural pine growth and there's lots of um, blackberry bushes in amongst all of that too. Can't just sort of go traipsing off into the bush. You've got to be very, very careful because there's gullies and God knows what. You just sort of walk off the edge of a drop if you're not careful. We were coming along and I said to the kids, it was spring, and I said to them, do you want to stop? We'd had rain. And I said, do you want to stop at the falls? I bet they're running because we've had rain. And because uh, I only ever run when it's raining. And they said, oh, yeah. And I said, well, grab some towels and we'll go for a swim. We always swim at the bottom of the falls. It's a bit hard to get to. You've got to walk around an outcrop of rock and then you've got to sort of make your way across quite a lot of rock that's in the riverbed to be able to get to the bottom of the pool where the falls are. So it's not an easy walk. It's short, but it's not easy to get to the falls. It can be quite slippery and you have to be quite careful how you walk across those rocks. We pulled into the car park and the girls just opened the door and took off, grabbed their towels and they were running and screaming across the um, <laughs> across the rocks to the bottom of the fall and I come around the back because my son was still in a booster seat so I was unstrapping him out of his booster seat and it suddenly struck me it was very quiet. There was no no insect noises, there was no bird noises, the road wasn't busy so there was no car noises but we heard what sounded to be like a little girl crying. Um, but not. Yeah, you, you mentioned in your submission that it was kind of like that, but there was something off about it. Yeah, just not, yeah, it was, um, yeah, it's very difficult to explain. So it was very childlike, um, you know, the, uh, <laughs> but not in that, not what you would expect from a child. Was it, and, was it a cry or, or a whimper? It was like a... I'm I'm scared. I, you know, it was it was almost what you would sort of expect from a lost child. That's the yeah. only way I can think of. And my first reaction, because there was another car parked in the car park, but all the doors were open, the boot was open, there was clothes, there was jerry cans, there was utensils and and food containers, but no food everywhere, all around the car. And I remember looking at it, thinking, God, that's strange. And then I heard what I thought was a little child crying and I thought, oh my God, there's a child lost, which is not hard to do because directly off the car park is the trail that leads up the side of the mountain to the top of the fall and that was parked right beside that trail and I thought, oh, this little girl's wandered into the bush and has got lost and she can't, and I just assumed that whoever the adult was was up there looking for her and my son said, mum, I think that little girl is in trouble. And I said, yeah, I I think so. And then it just stopped. And I said, oh, well, mum's found her or, you know, didn't really think much of it. And by this stage, I'm still thinking it's odd. There's no sounds of birds. There's no 
crickets, there's no cicadas, there's always a lot of bush noise in that area and all we could hear was the roar of the waterfall. And I was thinking, this is just really weird and it just felt weird. There was just a really odd feeling but I was so distracted by the kids, the car that was not there, the little girl that I thought had just found a mum in the bush somewhere. I really, I ignored that, I guess is a good way to put it. I Mm -hmm. just ignored that that was wrong. There was just so much wrong. But by this stage, the three girls were at the bottom of the waterfall. My boy is running ahead of me to try and get to the waterfall. So he was a little bit in front of me and I was carrying his towel and we were walking along the track um, along the outcrop of rock. It's all rock. So the whole waterfall, it's like a semicircle of rock. There's a lot of rock and it's an amphitheater, so a lot of the noise is just amplified in there. It's quite tall. I'd say it's probably two or three stories tall, quite a big waterfall. So the noise is quite loud in that cavern. You walk around an outcrop of rock, sort of go around it and then spin back to your right, and then you can see the waterfall. It opens up and you can see all the rocks and the waterfall and the amphitheater and by this stage, the girls were screaming, they're in the water. and Crying had stopped at this stage? The crying had stopped before my son and I had even left the car oh, park. And, okay. and I'm saying, you know, what sort of parent would let their children wander around? Like, isn't it just stupid, irresponsible parenting and being the judgmental parent? But it had stopped, so I just assumed. Otherwise, I'd have gone up the track looking for her. Get to just around the outcrop, and Josh is just starting, that's my son, is just starting to go across the rocks. And the girls were screaming, like they're having a blast. <laughs> and this bellow just come out of nowhere. And it was, we all just sort of stopped dead and listened to this sound bounce around and around and around this amphitheater. And it was incredibly loud. It was incredibly aggressive. And it was very, very deep. It was a guttural, I don't even know how to describe it. Is there another animal that makes a similar sound, do you think? Without actually having hear it, it's sort of what I would have expected from maybe a bear, that horrible, you know, you just, it's sort of what, it was not lion-like or uh-huh. or any of the cats. It was more what I would expect from a bear maybe, but a, a big one. We all sort of stopped dead and went, what in God's name, is that the whole sound is, and it just all the hairs on the back of our neck stood up, all the hairs on my arms stood up, and my son flung around in absolute terror and come flying towards me. The girls took off from the pool because it sounded like it was in there with us, like it actually sounded like it was at the base of the waterfall. Like we would have seen it if it was, put it that way, but we didn't know where it had come from. And you heard and the roar so, over the roar of the water and the waterfall. Oh, it was incredibly loud. You couldn't not hear it. It just bounced and bounced and bounced off the rocks. The girls were screaming. They were just in a mad panic and they're screaming, what is it, what is it? And I'm going, I, I don't know, I don't know. And they sort of flew past and I said, just get to the car. Just, and that was when I realised we were in a little bit of trouble because I didn't know what this was. I was by myself, single parent. There was two children that weren't mine with me and I'm like just get to the car just get to the car and I'm flicking the unlock button the girls were dropping thongs and towels and god knows what as their clothes as they're running because they were still in their bikinis and Josh was trying to pick it all up and anyway I just basically scooped him up and he was facing over my shoulder back towards the waterfall And I was running and picking things up along this track back to the car. Then I started to hear the branches, the trees snapping along the ridgeline above the waterfall. And I stopped and turned around and had a look back towards the waterfall and I was watching the trees bend and snap and bend and snap and bend and snap. And I'm thinking, what in God's name? And I could hear the pounding coming down the side of the hill. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, what is this? We got back to the car. The girls are still in the panic. I've put Josh down, told him to just get in. Didn't even care about seatbelts. Just get in the car. Get in the car. I'm screaming at them by this stage to get in the car. We were panicking by that stage because we just didn't know what the hell had just happened. 
do you know, I, I wasn't until after we were on the highway, my first thought was, I, I, get in the car, let's go. But it wasn't until I was on the highway that I went, oh, my God, the other people there. Didn't even cross my mind at that particular time that there was another car there. There was what I thought was a little girl crying in the bush. Like, didn't even cross my mind at that time. We are just panicking. We had to go. One of Mahala's friends flung the door open. Mahala's my daughter. He hit Josh in the head, nearly knocked him out. I picked him up and just threw him in the back seat. No, no booster seats, nothing. Threw all the crap in on top of them. And as I come round the back of the car to get in the driver's seat, I was watching the trees bend. And that's when I realised that they were not little trees. These were, you know, 20 foot trees. And they were bending and snapping from the top. And I'm going, what in God's name? And I could hear this crashing just coming down the side of the mountain. And then I smelt it and it just took my breath. I don't know if I could even describe the smell. It was the most vile, it was like rotten flesh. It was worse than roadkill. Oh, roadkill's nothing compared to it. It nearly made me vomit. I was dry reaching. We had the windows down because it was a hot day. I think for memory, it's about 30 degrees, 35 degrees. So for spring, it was a very hot day. So the windows were down. The kids were, you know, but they're still screaming, what is it? What's that smell? What? Oh, my God. And, you know, Amy's, one of Mahala's friends in the back was going, I think I'm going to vomit. And I'm thinking, I'm going to vomit. So that only increased the panic. We've got whatever this is coming down the hill, this smell this most overpowering smell. So I just jumped in the car and as I turned, so the way I was parked, I could pretty much turn to the right and it was pointed back up the road to leave that area. As we drove past where the car was parked, so it was very much the trail. There's only one trail on that side of the creek that leads to the top of the mountain and it was that trail. Whatever was coming down the hill was on that trail. It was right behind with a parked car. Anyway, I could see this shape coming through the bush and it was huge. It was so big and it was so broad at the shoulders. So just to give you an idea, my brothers are 6'9 and 6'5. They're very big men. They're huge. They're broad across the shoulders. They're military, so they're very fit. They're very muscly. And this thing was a lot bigger than them. By feet. And I just literally sideways out of that car park. I just, I had three kids in the car screaming. My son was white and shaking in shock. He wasn't talking. He was just standing between the seats in the back, shaking. And as we got to the top of the highway, there was a police officer coming in the highway patrol car. He flashed his lights for me to stop. None of us are in seatbelts. We are all screaming. The kids are not even, like Josh is not even in a car seat. He's standing there looking like he's seen a ghost. The girls are hysterical. And he says, we got reports of an abandoned car down there. And I, and I just looked at him and said, my God, don't go down there. There's something that's just, there's something there. There's something there. Just, and then just drove off. And I often wondered what he was thinking. Like this bunch of hysterical females and this poor little kid in the car. But he drove down. He did drive down. I watched him in the rearview mirror actually drive down. I went, oh, my God, oh, my God. And I kept saying, it's in the car park, it's in the car park. It's down there, it's down there, and just left. I didn't even stop to let the kids actually put their seatbelts on. I made them do it while we were doing 110 on the highway because I just wanted to get away from whatever the hell it was we had just experienced. We then headed into Coonabarabra, and so I had 30-kilometre drive from then back into town, and I could see the lights coming from behind me, No siren, just the lights going, and it was the same police officer that went down into the car park. And it was only a few minutes later. It wasn't a huge amount of time, maybe five, maybe ten minutes. I had a bit of a start on him, and I was not sitting below the speed limit, put it that way. Um, He caught me, and he went around me, and all of us just sort of looked to our right as he went around us because he just didn't even slow down. He just come flying up behind us and was gone. And the kids, we all sort of looked at each other and by this stage the kids had calmed down a little bit and they kept saying, did he see it? Did he see it? And I said, I, I, don't, I don't know. Obviously, I don't know. 
and they're going, did you see the look on his face, Mum? You know, all the girls are saying, did you see him? Did you see him? He looked scared. And I went, well, he probably looked like we looked 10 minutes ago. So by the time we got to Coonabarabra and the kids had calmed down and I dropped this little girl home and just said, look, we've just had a really unusual incident out at the falls. Well, everybody in Coonabarabra knows it as the falls. And I said, look, I to her mum and I said, I'm not 100% convinced that she's not going to have any issues tonight. Told her what happened and she said, oh, yeah, no, things like that happen every now and then in the Pilliga. And I went, well, yeah, I know, but we're not really in the middle of the Pilliga here. We're just on the edge of the Pilliga. And she goes, yeah, yeah, okay, no worries. Pretty casual. <laughs> and I sort of went, okay. And um, I didn't put this in the report, but I had to go back to Coonabarabran for work about a week and a half later. And I actually called into the police station to ask if that police officer was okay. He said, all I can tell you is he come back to the station. He sat in the kitchen with a cup of coffee and his hands were shaking and he was as white as a ghost. And he's on leave. Did they ever tell you his name? No, never told me his name, but I do know that he never went back to work and he left the police force. Never, ever spoke about what he saw that day to anybody within the police force. Whatever it was would have crashed out into the car park pretty much as we drove out. So it would have still been there when he drove down. It was months and months and months later that I found out my parents had been there that day as well. And they had just gone for a Sunday drive with one of their friends and they'd actually stopped there for coffee about 11 in the morning. We lived in Bogabri for a long time, which is near the Pilliga, and we were always told, you know, you never go into the Pilliga, you never yeah. go hunting in the Pilliga, yeah. there's strange things happen, you know. But in my mind, Coonabarabra is so far removed from the Pilliga, like in between Coonar and Gill, but in actual fact it's not. It's right on the edge of the Pilliga. Yeah, so we also always were told that, and people used to go missing all the time. They'd drive in there to go hunting, they'd find a car, but they'd never find a person. That was quite a common occurrence when we were kids so we knew we knew how dangerous the Pilliga was and but never in a million years did we give the falls a thought because we used to take that trail to the top of the falls all the time and you know my brothers and I would clamber up the side of that hill and and we'd climb onto the rock and you know we'd fluff around up there in the creek 12 months later or more I used to do a lot of shift work so I got home about 11 o'clock or something and you know my boy woke up and come down and we were just chatting about our day and I turned the telly on and Finding Bigfoot was on. Mm -hmm. So he was maybe eight or nine by this stage. He was laying on the lounge reading a book and he was just casually looking up every now and then at the show. Anyway, there was a simulation. They, they do computer simulations in this particular show. Uh, it was the first time I'd actually seen it. Anyway, he just <laughs> casually says, oh, that's what I saw at the top of the waterfall. Remember that thing yelled at us? And he said, well, that's what I saw at the top of the waterfall. And that's when he described what he'd seen to me. So when I picked him up and put him over my shoulder, he saw it stand up. So there's a very big rock at the top of the falls, about six foot. So he said it was squatting beside the rock. But he said when he saw, I saw him, he stood up. And I said, how big was he? And he said, oh, he was taller than the rock. And then he just took two steps and was in the bush. And I went, holy crap, that's big because the bush is maybe seven, eight metres from that rock. And he said, and then he pushed the tree and it broke and you stopped and looked. And I went, yeah, I did. And he said, it was like dark brown. And he said it had very long arms. And I said, why do you say that? And he goes, because when it swung its arm to move the tree, it was really long. He said, like E.T., like E.T., he had really long arms. And I said, did you see the face? And he goes, yes. Had no fur on its face and its eyes were black. I sort of told him what I'd seen coming out of the bush, you know, the broad shoulders, the arms not quite to the knees but long, mm -hmm. you know, very, very thick arms, thick legs. I couldn't see any definition of face or anything like that because the bush is quite dense. It's, it was in the shade. I couldn't mm -hmm. quite see, you know, huge amounts of definition. I could definitely see that it was shaggy, very, very shaggy. 
definitely wasn't black. It was a browny colour. And he said, yeah, that's what I saw too. And you could see like shoulder like muscles in the arms or did you see any definition anywhere? Or, or very defined. Like it, it was just huge. Like you normally, you know, with adult men you see, you know, the the top of the arm, the muscles in, mm-hmm. I don't even know what they're called. Um, I get freaked out every time I talk about this story. This was just like a tree stump from shoulder to wrist. It was it was huge. Like it was obviously smaller below the elbow, but still just full muscle. And through the shoulder, you could see you could see the shoulder muscles, like mm-hmm. between the shoulder blade and the neck. And well, if you want to call it a neck, there wasn't much neck at all. It was quite hit. The head was very close to the shoulders. Like it was no defined neck, I would say. And did you see any hands? Big, big hands. The only reason I remember thinking they were big was because it was pushing trees aside on this path. It would swing its arm up and push and the tree would snap about where it was pushing at. And that was, you know, I'd have to say eight off the ground, easy. It would swing its arm and then push because it was too big to get down this path. Sort of thank God, because I think if it had come out, it was angry. It, it was really, really angry. We shouldn't have been there. You know how you walk into someone's house and it's very, very obvious that they've just had a huge argument and you just know you shouldn't be there? And yeah. that's the feeling I had. We shouldn't have been there. It was like we'd interrupted something and it was unexpected for us to be there and we shouldn't have been there. Right. And do you think that's connected to the crying sound that you heard? Um, I often thought, had they come looking for water, had we interrupted them and, and, and what we heard was a child. Was it a little one and was that the aggression? Because, you know, in nature that's what, animals do, isn't it? They become aggressive to protect the young. And I just often wondered if that's what I was hearing. You know, it was the juvenile we'd heard and they perceived us as a threat because the girls were being incredibly noisy, screaming and laughing. And, you know, I just, I just felt, did were we perceived? I mean, this is not at the time, obviously, because we were just terrified at the time. But, you know, on reflection, were we interrupting something? Was there something there that we were interrupting, that we shouldn't have been, where they protecting a younger one of whatever we saw. I mean, my grandfather spoke of Yowies all the time and worked with the Aboriginal community in a lot of different roles, and I know that they're out there, but never in a million years did I expect to experience what we experienced that day. You had heard of family stories about Yowies in the past, The first I heard about it, oh, look, I would have been very young, maybe six or eight, I guess, and my grandfather had gone up into the Harvey Ranges to cut wood and the truck had broken down, so him and his mate had decided to... I got a flat tyre, I think, for memory, and or two flat tyres and didn't have enough spares, so they would just jack the truck up and were waiting to go into Yeovil the following day to get the spare tyre and go back and pick the truck up, and... They were asleep in the cab. This is my grandfather. So, you know, Dar was known for his tall tales, so we never took much notice when he said, you know, they woke up in the middle of the night and the truck was being rocked and they just drove off and left the tyre and the jack on the side of the road. Yeah, and I just assumed it was one of those tales and never took much notice. When we were living in Bogabri, like we knew that there was something out there, but no one had ever described it to us and no one had ever sort of put a name to it, just don't go into the pillar. Be careful if you're going to go into, you know, don't leave the road, you know, those types of things. So we never really knew what was there, just don't go there. We thought it was actually said to scare us because it's such a dense forest that if you did wander off, the chances of being found were very slim. And, Mm. you know, the Pilliga Princess stories, you know, the ghost stories about the Pilliga Princess and, you know, all of those types of things. When you're growing up as a kid, you just assume that it's to scare kids from going in there. It was years later I found out the Pilliga Princess was actually a a woman and she was very much alive when we were kids. She only died in 1994 or something, I think, something like that. 
So, yeah, so when we grew up out there, she was an actual woman, but we just assumed that she was a ghost. The true story is she lost her husband, and with that she lost a bit of her mental faculties, and mm-hmm. she just packed up and lived out in the humpy on in the Pilliger, and she used to wander the highway between Narrabri and Coonabarabra, and basically she would sell herself for a bit of money to get food. Mm-hmm. It turned out she had children and everything that had died long after we left the area. So, I mean, we used to hear things like that, but nothing to describe what we saw. I went back to the falls. I took my daughter to Armadale when she was 18. I took her out for an open day for the uni when she was 18. This was years later. And on the way back, I said to them, we're going to call into the falls. And the look of horror on these kids' faces And they're going, no, we're not. And I said, we need to face this. Like, this has been a fear that we've all had. We need to face it and we need to go back. And I need to prove to you kids that there's nothing wrong with going to this place. Much to their horror, I pulled in (laughs) and we were all terrified. And the first thing we did was wind the windows down and we could hear the birds. And once we could hear the birds and we could hear the bush life and we knew then it was okay to get out. And we wandered down to the waterfall and, you know, took some photos of the kids. But they did say to me when they got back in the car that that would absolutely be the last time. They're glad they went back, but it would be the last time that they would ever set foot in that place. My parents used to stop there all the time. And they were there the day that this happened, unbeknownst to me. Even my mum and dad were spooked by that incident. They didn't see or hear anything other than no bush noise. They had Uh a really horrible feeling of being watched. And that was a couple Um, of hours before you got there? So that was at 11 in the morning, I think Dad said. You got there a few hours later? One-ish, one, one thirty. A couple of hours later and there's still not a lot of bush noise? No. There was four of them. There was four. Just went for a Sunday drive after church and... You know, church finished about nine o'clock and off they trotted. A mum and her friend uh, were setting up morning tea, so they had them as a coffee. Rosemary made the comment that there was no bush noise and mum said, yeah, it's just, I'm very uneasy for some reason. Mm -hmm. And dad and Alan had walked across to the car to see if there was anyone there that needed help because there was just stuff everywhere and all the doors were open the boot was open. Mm -hmm. Alan went to touch something. Dad said, Alan, don't, I... I feel like we're being watched. And Alan, Dad's friend, said, actually, I do too. He said, I'm really uneasy. Like, this is, there's something wrong. And Dad said, yeah, there's there's definitely something wrong. Anyway, they went back to Mum and Rosemary and said, look, I think we should pack up. And Mum said, well, I'm really pleased you said that. Something's wrong. And she goes, there's no noise. There's no no birds. There's no bush noise. And Dad said, oh, I feel like we're being watched. And Mum said, we do too. We need to go. They felt they were in danger. They had to go. Right. And they were the ones who reported the abandoned car to the police station, right? Yeah. Drove into Coonabarabran and went to the police station and reported the abandoned car out there because there was just not a soul, not a soul anywhere near this car. And, you know, we've never found out who owned the car or what happened. It was definitely towed um, because when I went back a couple of months later for work, the car was definitely not there. It had been towed and my staff member that lives in Coonabarabran had said, that they just assumed it was a stolen car because whoever was driving it was never located. This car was found 35 kilometres away and with everything still in it, just all around the car on the ground. And all I know is that it was towed and they just assumed it was stolen because they never found anything. But after that period, there was a few car accidents in that area as well. And people had said they'd swerved for something but they weren't sure what it was. And a lot of people had said it. So it was really interesting. And there was a pattern of that for maybe 12 months after, and then it just all sort of stopped. Done it. Have you never seen another one since? No, no. But um, about – so same area, again, Killigar, going from Coonabarabra to Narrabri very early in the morning. I was driving up to Inverell for the day for work. I had Dad with me. And we were halfway through the Pilliga and there was an old couple on the side of the road and their caravan was on its side and completely destroyed. There was only just one other car that had stopped. And I said, maybe we need to stop and just make sure these people don't need help. What the hell happened to their van? And we thought he must have just lost control and, 
it had tipped, but he hadn't tipped. And he said, no, they were just driving along at dusk and next thing something, they don't know what, hit the side of the caravan and tipped it on its side and it was just totally destroyed. While they were driving? Yeah. He said they were just driving along, doing about 80 because it was dusk, there were a few yeah. kangaroos around. And uh, But, I mean, we know you don't ever, don't ever go through the Pilliger at night. You don't ever stop and camp there. They never stop in the Pilliger. Don't go in before dawn and make sure you're out by dusk. So it was dawn, early in the morning. Yeah. It was about, I guess, 7, 7.30 when I stopped because I still had three hours driving and had to be there for, at 11 o'clock for the meeting, for the press conference I was going up for. So, yeah, it was really early. It was 6.30, 6, 6.30 in the morning. They didn't see it, just flipped no, their van over. No, well, it hit them. Yeah, they were in the middle of the road, like they were in the middle of their lane and it hit them. No, don't know what it was. Right. Yeah, I just I can't stay. I've got to go. I've got to go. And I said, after what we went through, I'm not doing this again. I'm not doing this again. And it's really interesting because my husband's American. He's Native American. And he is a very big Bigfoot believer. The Native American people 100% attest to Bigfoot. Yeah, no, look, I can't explain what we saw. I can't explain what we heard. It's like nothing I've ever heard. How do you feel about all that story now? I mean, you, you mentioned you... You get goosebumps even just talking about it. Does it still... I hate it. I don't talk about it because people think you're nuts. People think you're crazy when you, you say, you know, but the smell, I can still smell it. It's just, it takes your breath away. It's like nothing I have ever smelt in my life. It was yeah. like rotten meat, but like a ton of rotten meat. You know, it wasn't just a little kangaroo and little kangaroos on the side of the road. And everybody says to me, Roadkill, they go, oh, God, roadkill. If I'm driving with them, I go, yeah, actually doesn't affect me as much anymore since that incident. Nothing compares to no. the smell that you smelled. No. It was horrendous. It was horrendous. And it was overpowering and it was nauseating. And I I had to battle to keep, because we'd stopped in Gilgandra and had lunch. So we'd only had lunch half hour before. And I really, really battled to keep, the food in my belly. I thought I was going to vomit for a long time after, probably 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and it lingered. It was like it was on you. Like it just, it sort of permeated our clothing or, I don't know, I just, I could still smell it for hours. Like I wasn't happy till I got home and had a shower and right. washed the clothes. And Did your car smell of it later? But yeah, I did think it did. And I used to drive with the windows down. There's only a handful of events in my life I can honestly say I was terrified and that I knew that I was in danger and that I knew I had to extricate myself from that particular situation Mm. or it wasn't going to end well. And it is number one on that list. I just knew. So for the first six months after it, I didn't know if it was my mind or my fear telling me that I could still smell it. I wasn't sure. You've told your now husband that story. Yeah, we were talking about bears, actually. Actually, um, We were talking about uh, his encounter he had with a grizzly. He said, they will hunt you and kill you. A black bear, a grizzly, you just if you walk into their territory, they get cranky, but a black bear will actually hunt you and kill you. And I said, oh, you know, how do you camp? And he goes, well, just very carefully, you're always on alert. And I went, mm, like the pilliger. And that's sort of how it came into conversation. Mm was we were talking about this black bear and he just sort of said, well, that's not the only thing that you need to worry about in the forest at home. And I said, oh, you know, why? why? What else are you thinking he meant rattlesnake or, you know, something like that? And he said, no, the Bigfoots can get very aggressive. You've got to watch for the signs and make sure you don't go into their territory. I told him what we encountered and he said, he's a Native American. Yeah. He's Cherokee Blackfoot. And when I explained it to him, he said, If they'd have had young with them and you've frightened the young or in some way intimidated them, they'd have come after you. And he said, they rip you apart. He said, you don't antagonise them. And he was the first one that had actually gone, yeah, okay, I believe you. My son was only seven when that happened. I don't think he's ever told a soul. I've told TJ, my husband, and Josh was sitting in the room and I just said, isn't that right, mate? And he'll just nod, but he won't actually verbalise a yes or 
just won't talk about it at all. And he's never mentioned it to anyone. My dad asked him about it and he just said, I don't want to talk about it, Pop. So whatever it was scared the blinking daylights out of him. Yeah, and and traumatised him. And being seven, I can totally understand it because the bellow that, I guess that's a good one, it wasn't really a scream, it was more a bellow that mm-hmm. come out of the bush. It was, yeah, it was scary. That's probably the scariest thing that happened was that because there was no indication, well, there was an indication, sorry, something was wrong, but we, I had ignored that. But, you know, the no noise, you know, dead silent in the bush, you don't hear that every day. But that was the first thing that we went, wow, and it stopped us all dead in our tracks. You know, there wasn't another step forward taken by me, that's for certain. <laughs> and I've never seen the, the three girls bounded across those rocks like goats. They were <laughs> not stopping for anyone. They were out of there. You can't, I can't even describe it. It was just so loud. It was so loud and so aggressive and so unexpected. And the feeling you got was that, and your son as well, that it was male or female? Well, he kept saying he. And I, I've got to say, I, I've said he all along, and I don't know why that would be. Like maybe the size of it, because it was so big. Yeah. It was so big. Like I said, my brother, my brother's almost seven foot, and it was way bigger than him, right. way bigger and broader. It was just, it, its shoulder width was massive. And dark brown. Yeah, dark brown. And Josh said the same thing as well. It was dark brown. It was not black. It was not caramel brown. It was dark brown. In your submission, you mentioned that your son had said when he looked back what what he was looking at looked angry and it opened its mouth like it was screaming. Did he hear anything? Did he hear if, if it looked like it was screaming, could he hear it screaming at the same time? Or? Well, this bellow was still echoing around us, so ah. it more than likely did bellow again because it echoed and echoed and echoed and echoed and it was punctuated. You know when you echo, it goes echo, echo, and it fades off? It yep. wasn't like that. It was just constant, loud. Yeah, it was crazy. Oh, I'm um, getting so goosebumps yeah, just just thinking about it. I can't imagine how frightening that would have been for you. Oh, it was terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. It was one of the most terrifying, like I said, it's the most terrifying situation I have ever been in. What happened at Hickey's Falls, I ignored that feeling when I first got out of the car because the girls had taken off. They were fun, having fun and... You know, the waterfall was running for the first time in ages and a bit of excitement because we don't have waterfalls <laughs> where we are. And I ignored that feeling. When I go into the bush now, I never ignore those feelings. No. If something's not right, we leave. You wouldn't get a chance to talk about it very much either, would you? No, not at all because we just don't. Like, honestly, my husband knows, my parents know, and the only reason they know is because they were there that morning themselves. And I spoke to my neighbour about it. And I did tell a friend and she was just, I was halfway through the story and she was just looking at me like I was nuts. And yeah. Yeah, and I did tell the mother of both of the girls that were with me. So the one from Coonabarra was like, yeah, whatever. The mum of the other little girl that was with me, was she was concerned and she goes, do you know what it was? And I said, no, look, I don't. But she comes from, um, she's from Greece, you know, only been in the country about seven years, you know, had Absolutely no idea what I was talking about. And she's like, okay. Uh, I only recently ran into her. She come back to town with her children to visit the grandparents. I ran into her down at Coles. I said, you know, do you ever think about that day? And she said, the scariest day of my life. And she said, I never told a soul and I never will. I never talk about it. So it mm-hmm. seems as just all of the kids were completely traumatized by it. And I did panic and I knew I had to get out of there because two kids there weren't mine. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And not to mention the seven year old and 15 year old screaming, go, just go, just go. What is it? What is it? Oh, it's terrible. It just sounds awful. Like you can joke about it, but I think when you are in terror and you feel like you're in terror for your life, that stays with you. Yeah, it does. You know, you tell people about it and they just look at you. And they're going, oh, what drugs were you on? It's yes. like, dude, I wish I was on yeah. drugs because that would explain. What we saw and heard, people do make light of these types of situations without actually understanding the trauma that it actually can impart on people, I think. And a friend of mine was 
stuttering over telling me about what she believed to be a UFO when she was a young girl. And she's going, you just don't look surprised. And I said, no, I'm not judging you because I know how you feel. When you see something you can't explain, something that shouldn't be there, something that you've been told doesn't exist or there's no proof of it, I said, I get people judging that. Mm -hmm. And I said, I will never do that to anyone. I'll never do it to anyone else because I didn't feel comfortable telling anybody what I experienced. And I think that's probably been the hardest part for me is that I've not been able to share that until I did meet my partner. My mum and dad every now and then will bring it up because it's stuck with them as well. Their experience was scary for them because they were in their late 60s. You know, four older people, again, in a vulnerable position, and it stuck with them as well, yeah. that feeling. And for me, it was just a relief that my new beautiful partner understood and he said, well, you know, I believe you. And that just those words was like, really, you believe me? And it was just, it was such a moment, um, I guess it was overwhelming because I'd had, you know, 10 years of no one, well, mum and dad did, but, you know, you sort of, you can tell your parents anything, you know, do you know what I mean? Parents are there to support your kids, but yeah. to have somebody outside your family go, it's okay, I believe you. And that's when I've started talking about it. I believe you too. I can sense the, the sincerity in your voice, totally. It's the most eerie place, and it doesn't matter what time of day or night you drive into it, it is one of the most frightening places I've ever driven. And I had to come through it one night from Brisbane. This is after this event at Hickey Falls. When my daughter, uh, they sold the unit block and she was evicted with no notice, and she decided to come home and go to uni in Sydney. So I went and picked her up and we come through the Pilliga and I had debated about staying in Narrabri. And anyway, I thought, no, I'm going to stay. Couldn't get a motel. And I thought, oh, my God, I can't get a motel. I have to drive through the Pilliga. And I thought, maybe if I go to Gunnedah, I might go out to Bogabrone across to Gunnedah and see if I can get a motel. But instead of driving the hour and a half, I rung. No motels. So I couldn't get motel rooms anywhere. And I thought, oh, my God, it is 1 o'clock in the morning and I have to drive through the Pilliga. I said to my daughter, you stay awake. And, you know, she said to me, she fell asleep <laughs> with her head under the blanket. And she said to me, oh, God, years later, she goes, Mum, do you know why I slept? And I said, why? She goes, because if something was going to happen, didn't want to see it coming, not oh. like last time. And she slept right through the Pilliga. Whether it's 1 in the morning, whether it's 10 in the morning, it is still the same ominous feeling the second you drive into that area. Mm. There is something so bad out there. Um, it's very hard to explain the emotion. I'm still confused by it. It's still something that I just shake my head and go, what? Like I said, there's nothing to compare it to. So, you know, you hear the stories of these things existing, but when you actually see something, it's just surreal. There's nothing to describe it. I do a little show called Yowie Central. Play some interviews that are, and snippets from podcasts and it's just a general information for people who might not necessarily know much about these creatures. If you're interested in learning more about it, you're more than welcome to, to check that out. Oh, look, I, I think so because um, unless you've experienced it, you don't get it. I think you don't get it. And I think for people that have experienced it, to actually listen to or talk to people who have experienced it, makes all the difference yeah. because there's that connection of, yep, I get you. I totally get where you're coming from type yeah. feeling and I think it makes all the difference. It gives you peace of mind. I still think about it. still think about it a lot. So unexpected. 